do in the do. Start. Um, what do you think about when you think about performance-based niche sports? Do you want to say who I am as well? Yeah. Hello, I'm Doug Lyon. I'm a media lecturer at Brighton University. And what I think about when I think about niche sports is... Um, it's a fine line between performance and sport, but I think of it as a non-competitive thing. I think that's really the, the the thing that really comes to my mind. But I kind of I see it as a little bit like um, the break dancing thing in New York in the eighties. It's like people are basically showing off, but in a way that's quite good. That they help each other out and skills share and. You know, what came out of that breakdancing thing is like, you are kind of showing off and there is a bit of an edge to sort of doing something better than somebody else, but only because they're going to do it as well and then you'll have to do something else. It's not like beating somebody. And I think that really bled into the whole skateboard culture of, you know, I think it's really lovely to see lads on the park showing each other how to do stuff. And I think that's what comes to my mind with those kind of sports is they're not competitive in that way of beating somebody that it's much more of a community cooperative skill share thing and um, is that the same um, you think about when you think about circus sports or the circus culture yeah I mean circus culture stuff like juggling I mean you know Brighton's got, got a scene around juggling um, the juggly scene in Brighton, I used to think was a bit hippie, and I was like, oh, God, not more jugglers. And actually, I think it's got more interesting, and the hula hoop thing, and trapeze, silks, and all that kind of stuff that came out of the circus that's now left that arena and has kind of got a life of, out, of it outside of it, I think it's really good, because I didn't really like circuses, like circus circuses. I thought they were a bit silly, but actually a lot of the skills and things that went on within it put into a different environment, I think, much more interesting. So do you think it's getting more um, popular and commercial now? Because I have a couple of pictures of Hula Hoop, which seems to be getting quite commercial within fashion and advertising. Well, it's what always, it's what always happens with, with anything that is on a, on a fringe, whether it's art, philosophy, politics, music... Um, there's always the mainstream and there's always something other than the mainstream and when you look at the fringes of something that's where things generally get more interesting and a bit more dangerous or edgy or scary or sexy and then what happens is the mainstream kind of accommodate it and take the rough edges off it and make it a little bit more easy for sort of Joe Bloggs person to, to accept and that often happens through advertising. So like, I was just talking to Sonia before about that, um, you know, the Velvet Underground song that's sort of shiny, shiny boots of leather in its whole. It's an S and M anthem that gets attached to a car commercial, because what the car's saying is, "Whoa, you know, you get this car, you're going to be edgy and sexy, and all this stuff's going to go on, and wow, it's going to be amazing." And it's like that. The original meaning of that song has got completely consumed by this commercial thing. I mean, is that a bad thing? Oh, I don't know. I mean, who cares, really? It's it's kind of what happens. And, and I think the fact that the mainstream endlessly accommodate the avant-garde or the experimental makes that world have to rethink things because it's it's been done. So how do you think does it change for people that are doing it if it becomes more commercial? Well, I think you've got to come up with something new, haven't you? Because it's it's like you know dubstep's a classic example. Like two, three years ago, three years ago, maybe four years ago, nobody had heard that sub bass sound. It didn't exist in music, and then that became a sort of a signifier of that genre, that sort of woo 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 bass, sub bass. And then you know Britney sticks it into the middle of a tune, and then it's like okay, we're off. So now the mainstream has, has consumed that signifier. Does that mean that you can't use that anymore because Britney's wrecked it? Sort of does a little bit because it's it's done. So now what's next? I mean, that's what makes things exciting, isn't it? Is the mainstream consume the avant-garde or the interesting, the experimental, and it makes that world have to kind of go, oh, we can't do that anymore. It's been 
it's been taken away from us now. It's like burlesque, you know, burlesque six, seven years ago, nobody had heard of it. It was quite a niche thing. It's like a sport, it's not really a, it's not a sport, but it's a mixture of dance and performance and theatre and cabaret and art and music. And now it's like it's ev it's 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 just saturated out because it's everywhere. What would you say um, those niche sports, performance-based niche sports, maybe the circus niche sports? What would you classify them as? Like art, sport, subculture, lifestyle? Uh, well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? I think they are subcultural when they when they are subcultural when when they're niche. But then, when they become mainstream, then that's that's not can't be subcultural and mainstream at the same time. And where the line is between subculture and mainstream, I, I don't really know. But it's you know, with music, it's like if only a few thousand people know of something and it's only played in certain clubs, and you have to go there to hear it, then that's very definitely a subcultural thing. And so, as soon as it's on the radio, arguably, it's not a subculture anymore. With with the sport thing. Um, I guess you know. Usually, when something's turned up in advertising, it's that's that's it. It's done. It's dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, what part do you think internet um, play for those sports and subcultures? <coughs> well, I think what's great about the internet, and it's still something I'm having to learn as an old person, is that anything you want to learn, somebody's made a video about it, and it's on YouTube. I mean, anything. And I think that's really wonderful. And I think for th for skill sharing, that's the real gift that the internet has given us. Because the internet is largely a sea of shite. You know, it's mostly rubbish, and you have to really search through a lot of shit to find something worthwhile. But if you want to go, how do I do this particular skateboard trick or hula hoop thing or whatever, and Google it, somebody somewhere will have made a video about it. And if you can be bothered to watch it and follow the instructions, you can probably learn how to do it. And that kind of throws up a lot of questions about education and all kinds of things these, these days, but I, I think it's different for education because it's not just about learning something, it's about how do you critically think about things. I don't think you can learn that from a video. And you can't learn how to do... You can't learn how to ride a bike by watching somebody ride a bike. You've got to ride the bike. But I think you can watch a video that might help you do it. And I think that's a wonderful thing about the internet. I mean, it's all really new, isn't it? It's only like 10 or 15 years old, really, all this stuff. Um, but then being special is harder, because that, that, that's, that's the tricky thing, is if everybody can do everything yeah. or can access everything, how do you do something that really stands out? That's, that's the thing that's made more difficult. That's also, though, on the internet sometimes, as in people do new things, adventures, and put them up. Yeah, the but then it's done, isn't it? So then, then you've got a... It's like, that's done. Somebody's made that video, they've put it on YouTube, so now I have to do something else. Um, other topic. Why do you think people do it, participate in those sports? What, all niche sports? No, m mainly hula hoop, silks, acrobatics. OK, well, it's why do people do it? Because it's fun, because it's... Makes you feel better about yourself, keeps How? you fit. How does it make you feel better about yourself? Doesn't it? I'd say it does. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. So there's a sense of achievement and accomplishment about it. If you try and do something and you can't do it and then two months later you can do it, anything makes you feel good about yourself. And it's also something about... What I really love to see people do is do something that involves discipline. You know, that's a lot of discipline to practice something... Behind, you know, to make something look effortless and good, there's always like, what do they say? It's something like ten. It takes ten thousand times of doing something to become an expert in it. It's a lot, and so when you make something look effortless, like the best jugglers or hula hoop people, or whatever, they're doing something and it looks easy. You know how much effort has gone behind making that look easy, and that's discipline. And I think. That's a really good thing to have in your life, that ability to, to practice something a thousand times till you get it, even when you have to go through that feeling of just like, I can't do this, can't do it, I'm never going to get this, and then you do it and you keep doing it and then you get it. It's an amazing feeling. Um, 
And how do you think that's different, those sports, what you'd learn and what you get out of them from mainstream sports? Well, I, th I think it's a fundamentally different thing. And my, my daughter, when she was little, used to mess around on the bars in the park. And she'd be hanging about on these bars for hours, flipping about and doing all this stuff. And she went into a gymnastics class. And as soon as they saw her, they were like, we're having you in the county team. You're some park girl, but we'll soon train you up and get you. Like, we need you to come three times a week, and we need you to do this. And she was like, no, 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 no. I'm just doing it because I like doing it. Forget, I'm not doing it. But they spotted it in her straight away that she had the talent and the skills, but she had no interest in competing against anybody else. And I think that was a real turning point for her because she, she knew that she had a talent, but you don't have to do that competitively to enjoy it. And I think that's where those kind of sports really come in, is to join a community of people who just get off and doing what they're doing and sharing it with each other, for each other. That's lovely. It's very different from doing something because you want to beat somebody to make you better or your team better or your culture or country better. I mean, it's time we grew out of that. So you reckon it's mainly like self... I don't know, individualisation, that was like one of the main values and ideologies behind doing um, it or freedom or what else do you think are like mainly, main values that are behind those sports? I think it's, it's something about, yes, there's an individual side to it which is satisfactory and, you know, discipline and sort of self fulfillment but the, the cooperative thing is kind of like being in a band you know if, if everybody does their bit and it works then the the end result is bigger than the sum total of each individual bit mm -hmm. you create something bigger than the individual components and that is what makes things feel a bit magical and lastly, why do you think um, those new sports are becoming so popular now? I think we're just tired of... Um, it's like there's almost like a backlash undercurrent at the moment of things going back in time. It's like now we've got these flashy gizmos. It's like, yeah, I've got the whole world at my fingertips, in my pocket... Everything's easy, you know, things got too easy. It's like your generation, you know, you can think of a tune, you've downloaded it and you've got it 30 seconds later. You know, ancient people like me who had to wait two weeks and then catch a bus to a record shop to get the album that you wanted and then you couldn't, you know, you had to carry it home and get it out and put it on. And it's like that kind of specialness was really special. Now when you just, yeah, I've got it, you know, people want something special back, and I don't think that's something that you can't feel special without having to work for something. Mm -hmm. If you get it too easily, it's like, so what? So I think that's why it's coming back, is like, now we've got everything at our fingertips, we don't even know what to do with it. People are coming back, you know, phones are getting bigger again. You know, now we've grown out of... Um, people putting stupid ringtones on their phones. Now everybody's got a ring again. Now somebody's phone rings and everybody looks around because everybody's got a ring, just a normal ring on it again. It's like things are coming back round. It's like a phone is a phone. It's not. It doesn't have to be a computer. It doesn't have to be everything. You're just talking to somebody. I mean, it's, it all sounds very old school. I mean, if I had my way, I would teach you lot on old analogue kit because there was something about if you cut something with a razor blade, which is what I had to do yeah. for 10 years, to edit it together, you, there's no control Z, you've made a decision. It was really satisfying. And I, I just think that's what's happening. I think people want that old school... Hands-on battery. Yeah, ta it's tactile as well. That's, that's the thing, the trouble with computers is... You know, when you had a reel-to-reel -reel recorder and you had to tape and razor blade and sticky bits and... You know, editing was a very tactile thing, You're clicking a mouse or just, you know, we're going to move up soon, we'll move away from QWERTY keyboards and a mouse and it'll just be like clicking your fingers or a voice command. But I think everybody wants that experience of something that's tactile. It's a big part of who we are as human beings to touch things and feel the space around you and apparatus. And I think parkour is a really interesting thing that's come out of all of that now. It's like... 
reclaiming urban space as something that can become a playground that's not, you know, some horrid old dirty office block suddenly becomes something you can play with. I think that's really brilliant. Is that a useful kind of shite you wanted? That's good. <laughs>